The Superior Animal from Cucumber Chronicles by Joseph Ashby Sterry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Superior Animal Dr. Watts, many years ago, in not very lucid verse, attempted to elevate the bee. He endeavoured to place that vainglorious and boastful insect on a pyramid of virtue. He depicted it as the most self-denying, the most kindly, the most thrifty, the most well-behaved insect in creation. He so wrote it up, I wonder whether Dr. Watts was a bee-master, and whether he made a large sum of money by the sale of honey, that the bee became at once the perfect insect. All children looked up to it as a paragon of excellence, an example of industry, and a model of propriety. I tremble to think what would have been the consequence years ago if any child in any well-regulated nursery had boldly denounced the bee. For many years I believed implicitly in its high qualities. It subsequently stung me. Then I began to question and to doubt. My doubts led to inquiry, and I eventually found the character of the bee would not bear investigation. After patient and elaborate research, I discovered it to be nothing more nor less than an entomological humbug, a sham, a delusion, and a snare. Indeed, the very peck sniff of insects. I subsequently published my opinion on this matter at very considerable length, and if it has led to the disestablishment of the bee in the nurseries of today, I own I shall be very glad indeed. The downfall of the bee led to my losing faith somewhat in Dr. Watts, and I found the more I read in his little volume, the less cause did I find for admiration. One line therein especially annoyed me. It was the oft-quoted, let dogs delight to bark and bite, it is their nature too. It is absolutely nothing of the kind. The worthy doctor, after having overlaid the bee with flattery, proceeds to libel the dog. Upon my word, this is a little too bad. It is not in the nature of any dog to take a delight in barking or biting. The doctor depicts the dog as of a vindictive disposition as being fierce, ill-conditioned, quarrelsome, and badly behaved. He is nothing of the kind. He is quiet, good-humoured, faithful, and sensible. He is more useful than most men. He is infinitely more ornamental than the majority of mankind, and he is undoubtedly more faithful than woman. He is worthy of imitation in many points. You often hear it said of a man who has been particularly unsuccessful and miserable, a man who has missed all his opportunities, who has plunged into vulgar dissipation, who has lost time and health and money, that he has led the life of a dog. He has, in point of fact, done nothing of the kind. If he had, instead of being miserable and unsuccessful, he would be happy and prosperous. The life of a dog is a good one. It is straightforward, healthy, and governed by the strictest laws of common sense. He eats when he is hungry, he drinks when he is thirsty, and he slumbers when he is sleepy. He has a very high order of intelligence, he has strong reasoning powers, and he can understand what is said to him. I know an instance of a dog understanding three languages, French, English, and Spanish. The only drawback in the dog is that he cannot speak. I am not sure, however, that this is a drawback. I know I should be delighted if certain men that I wot of were afflicted with dumbness for the rest of their lives. The very tone of some men's voices is enough to set your teeth on edge, and the moment they begin to talk it has the most irritating effect on their audience. I once heard of a man who was blackballed at a club because he had a peculiar rasping voice, and people said it was a very hard case. I myself do not see that it was. Why should 900 members be made miserable in their house because one man has a discordant voice? It must be borne in mind that it is important to be doubly particular 
on those points in a club. You need not invite a man with a discordant voice to your house, unless you like. But if he is once a member of your club, you must endure him and his voice for ever, whether you like it or not. It strikes me very forcibly that this has nothing whatever to do with the subject I have in hand. What I was about to urge was the immense superiority of the dog over other animals. Now compare him with the horse. I am not sure that I like horses much, and I do not think they care much about me, for they have a knack of flourishing a pair of polished steel shoes in the immediate neighbourhood of my head whenever they can get a chance. The horse requires all the care in the world. It has to be groomed, carefully fed, watched and studied. It is liable to catch cold, it suffers from fright, and is easily injured. A blow that a dog would consider a joke might probably ruin a horse for life. Indeed, it is infinitely more trouble and anxiety, and a deal more expensive than a live baby. Now the dog takes care of himself. He washes himself, feeds himself, grooms himself. He may fight with other dogs. He may roll over and over in the street. He may be kicked. He may get bruised. But it seldom takes any effect on him. He is always up to time smiling, and ready to go anywhere or do anything at a moment's notice. I am inclined to think that the dog possesses considerable advantage, too, over man, and there are many canine rules of life that might well be adopted by the human race. The dog is not troubled by changes of fashion, of custom, or of government. His coat is always in fashion. He is never worried by tailors, by hatters, or bootmakers. And whether collars are worn high or low, it is all one to him. He cares not for aestheticism or mashery. Fancy an aesthetic dog or a masheric dog. All the little annoyances, all the punctilio and observances of society are nothing to him. It is a matter of perfect indifference to him whether the Conservative Party is in power or whether the Liberals hold the reins of government. It is all one to him whether Shakespeare or burlesque is popular, and he would be equally unmoved whether intoxicating drinks were gratuitously distributed in the streets or if no wine, beer or spirits were permitted to be sold under any consideration in any part of Great Britain. The freedom of the dog and his absolute independence is something delightful. See him on a rainy day, when man is packed in omnibuses, struggling along with umbrellas, getting run over, and hailing handsome cabs. See how he bounds along, splashing through the mud, threading his way in and out and underneath cabs, omnibuses, carriages, and carts. Never for a moment annoyed with the weather, never getting run over, not dreaming of catching cold, and barking joyfully and wagging his tail gleefully as he trots along. When I see poor, splashed, shivering humanity wrestling with the elements, shivering with cold, and getting twinges of acute rheumatism from their damp clothes, I cannot help thinking that the dog has very much the best of it. When man reaches home, he has to change all his clothes. He probably has to take a glass of something warm, and it may perchance be an hour before he can feel at all comfortable. It is totally different with dog. Directly he arrives at his destination, he throws himself down before the fire. He hangs his tongue out of his mouth and he pants. He presently goes to sleep and eventually wakes up feeling none the worse for his wetting and his scamper through the mud. I cannot help having a shrewd suspicion that in this case dog is decidedly the superior animal. Again, who enjoys himself most when out for a walk? The dog or his master? The master plods quietly along, occasionally stopping here and there, but there is no sense of hearty enthusiasm or intense pleasure about him. But look at the dog. There are no bounds, or rather there are infinite bounds to his delight. He tears violently off in a straight line, and when you think he is quite lost altogether, he is back again at your feet, with his tongue hanging out and panting like a locomotive. He gives you a bright look with his kindly eyes, and he shakes his head as much as to say, Isn't this prime fun? But you don't half enjoy it, master. Then he gives a whine of delight, and one or two sharp short barks, and he's off again, running in circles after birds, or cloud shadows, 
or butterflies, or anything that will serve as the faintest excuse for violent muscular exercise. And compare your exercise with his. It is absolutely nothing. He stretches every fibre. He tries every tendon. He brings every muscle into full play. He has no fear of tight boots. He's not troubled with corns. He has no twinge of the gout. He goes ten miles to your one. He has playful scrimmages with other dogs. He rolls madly on the grass, shooting out his legs in all directions like telescopes. He thrusts his nose into hedges and hunts for imaginary rats. He paddles in ditches. He takes copious drinks of water. Water that you would require to be thoroughly filtered and fortified with brandy before you would dare to touch it. He takes a swim in the river and shakes himself violently when he comes out. And then off he starts for another mad chase as fast as his legs will carry him. If you go through a town or village, what a deal he has to look after and what an amount of important business he has to transact. He always has special enemies that live down impracticable courts, or who are chained up in impossible courtyards, and he feels compelled to go and jeer at them, to invite them to a little playful sparring, just to keep his hand in. Then he rushes into butcher's shops, to see if there is a stray bone or two about. He looks into baker's, where he has been occasionally treated to biscuit. He tries to make friends with the children. He pokes his nose into perambulators. He barks at officials, especially postmen, policemen and beadles. He runs into public houses. He takes flying trips round stable yards. He chivvies stray fowls. He bristles up his back at a big pink pig, which is being driven home. And he shakes his head and hangs out his tongue at the most important personage of the township who strides with stately step along the footway. Nothing seems to tire him, nothing seems to interfere with his keen sense of enjoyment, and nothing can repress his tremendous spirits and everlasting good humour. The only thing that will annoy him is if you drive home and want him to go in the conveyance with you. Then he begins to show symptoms of mistrust. He first gazes plaintively at you. Then he looks almost savagely at the driver. He will not remain at the bottom of the carriage, but he jumps on the front seat. He sits there uneasily. He screws up his eyes and looks silly. He turns round and round, but cannot find a comfortable resting place. He gives a faint whine, then a tremendous gape, and finally settles down, giving a dissatisfied growl, with his head on his forepaws, but with his eyes well open, on the lookout for anything that may occur. And presently, when the trap stops, he's out in a moment, he is off and away for another mad chase across the country, and barking joyfully at his emancipation. The great reason for the superiority of the dog over all other animals is that he lives in accordance with nature. The morrow gives him no anxiety, and his brethren give him no trouble. He does not worry himself as to what he shall do next week. Neither does he care a single meat skewer as to the welfare of his relatives. He does not cringe before a popular mastiff, neither does he wait humbly for the patronising nod of a noble Newfoundland. He does not refuse his dinner because it is not served à la Russe, neither does he grumble because his kennel is without a dado. He is probably less spoiled by over-civilisation than any other animal. He loves the open air, a prodigious amount of exercise, a moderate drink of cold water, enough never too much, of good plain food, and plenty of sound sleep, at no stated hour, but any time when he has nothing better to do. I fancy, my brethren, we might many of us learn a useful lesson from our friend, and however much we may revere man, I think I have said enough to show that, in many important respects, dog is the superior animal. If my noble old Saint Bernard, monk, were here, along with Jerry, best of bulldogs and truest of friends, and a certain handsome, kind-eyed collie, I think they would agree with me. End of The Superior Animal From Cucumber Chronicles by Joseph Ashby Sterry Read by Ted Hanlon